Our Father, who art in heaven. Yes? Uh, don't do that to me. Don't interrupt me. I'm praying. Who do you call me? Called you? Lord, I didn't call you. I'm praying. Our Father, who art in heaven. There you did it again. Did what? Call me. You said, Our Father, who art in heaven. Here I am. What's on your mind? But I didn't mean anything by it, Lord. I was, you know, just saying my prayers for the day. I always say the Lord's Prayer. It makes me feel sort of good, sort of like getting a job done. All right, go on. Hallowed be thy name. Hold it. What do you mean by that? Mean by what? By hallowed be thy name. Well, it means, it means good grief, Charlie Brown. I didn't know. I don't know what it means. How should I know? It's just part of the prayer. By the way, what does it mean? It means honored, holy, wonderful. Ah, that makes sense to me now. I never thought about what holy, holy means before. The kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you really mean that? Of course, Lord. Why not? Well, what are you going to do about it? Do about what? Nothing, I suppose. I just think it would be rather good if you got control of everything down here as you have up there in heaven. Have I got control of you? Well, I do go to church most Sundays. That isn't what I ask you. What about that bad temper? You really got a problem, you know. <laughs> and there's the way you spend your money all on yourself. And what about the kind of books that you read? Will you stop picking on me? I'm just as good as some of the rest of those hypocrites down at the church. Excuse me? I thought you were praying for my will to be done. If that is to happen, we will have to start with the ones who are praying for it. Like you, for example. Okay, all right. I guess I do have some hang-ups now that you mentioned it. I could probably name some others. So could I. <laughs> well, Lord, I haven't thought about it very much until now. But, you know, I really would like to uh, cut out some of those things I would like to, you know, be really free of all my bad habits. Good. Now we're getting somewhere. We'll work together, you and I. Some victories can be truly won. I'm proud of you. Look, Lord, I need to finish up here. This is taking a lot longer than it usually does. You know, it doesn't have very many words, but give us this day our daily bread. While we're talking about bread, you need to cut out the bread. You're overweight <laughs> as it is. Hey, wait a minute. Aren't you overweight? What is this? Criticize me day? Here I was doing my religious duty and all of a sudden you break in and remind me of all my bad hang-ups? Judy, praying is a dangerous thing. You could wind up getting changed, you know. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. You call me. Here I am. It's too late to stop now. Keep on praying. I'm interested in the next part of your prayer. Well, go oh. on. Oh, I'm scared to, Lord. Scared? Scared of what? I know what you'll say to me. <laughs> Try me. Let's see. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. All right. What about Bill? See, I knew it. I told you to do it. I knew you'd bring him up again. Why, Lord, he's told me lies about me. He's told lies about me. He's cheated me out of some money. Some money that I'll never see, and I could sure use it now. He never paid back that debt he owes me. I'm sw I've sworn to get even with him. But your prayer... What about your prayer? Oh, I didn't mean it. Well, at least you're honest. But it's not much for carrying out the bitterness around inside, is it? No, I guess not. But I'll feel better as soon as I get even. Boy, <laughs> have I got some plans for old Bill. He'll wish he never did me any harm. Believe me, you won't feel any better. You'll feel worse. Revenge isn't sweet. Think of how unhappy you already are, but I can help change that. Now, you can how? Forgive Bill. 
then I'll forgive you. Then hate sin. Bill's problems will be yours. You may, love the, you may lose the money, but you will have settled your heart. But Lord, it's so hard, I can't forgive Bill. Then I can't forgive you. Oh, oh, well, you're right. You usually are, and more than I want revenge on Bill, I want to be right with you. Oh, I don't know. All right, all right, I'll forgive him. Help me to find the right road in life, Lord. He's bound to be awfully miserable now that I, I think about it. Anybody who goes around doing the things he does to others has to be, be mixed up inside. Some way, somehow, show him the right way. There, now. Wonderful. Don't you feel better? Uh, hmm. Well, not bad, not bad at all. In fact, I feel quite tremendous. You know, I don't think I'll have to go to bed tense tonight for the first time since I can remember. Maybe I won't be so tired from now on because I'm not getting enough rest. Well, you're not through with your prayer, so go on. Mm. Oh, all right. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Good, good. I'll do just that. Just don't put yourself in a place where you can be tempted. Now, what do you mean by that, Lord? Change some of your friendships. Some of your so-called friends are beginning to get to you. They'll have you completely involved in the wrong things before long. Don't be fooled. They advertise that they're just having fun, but for you it would be ruin. Don't use me as an escape hatch. Lord, I don't understand what you're saying. Oh, yes, you do. You've done it a lot of times. You get caught in a bad situation. You get into trouble, then you come running to me. Lord, help me out of this mess. I promise I won't do it again. How many times have I heard that, Judy? Some oh. of those bargains you tried to make with me. <laughs> yes, and I'm ashamed, Lord. I really, really am. Which bargain are you remembering? Well... You remember when the woman next door saw me coming out of the local pub? I told my mother I was going to the shop. I remember telling you, Lord, oh God, don't let her tell my mother where I've been. I promise I'll be in church every Sunday. Well, she didn't tell your mother, but you didn't keep your promise either, did you? No, Lord, you're right. I'm sorry, Lord. I really am. Up until now, I thought that just praying was enough. I didn't expect you to come back, so I have to answer like this. Okay, go ahead and finish your prayer. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Do you know what would bring me glory? What would really make me happy? No, Lord, but I'd like to know. I want to please you. Now I can see how good it would be to be a real follower of you. You just answered the question. I did? Yes. The thing that would bring me glory is to have people like you truly love and follow me. And I see that happening between us. Now that some of these old sins are exposed and out of the way, there's no telling where we can go. Okay, Lord. Let's see what we can, you can make of me, okay? Yeah, let's see. Y'all help me to continue and pray for Judy. <laughs> Amen? Well, I'm excited about you being here this morning. We're on part number two of our series, The Lord's Prayer. Last week, we talked about being in God's family. Being in God's family. As we talked about the very beginning part of this prayer that says, Our Father who art in heaven. So just as a quick recap, number one, let me ask you a question. Does God have a family? Yes or no, church? Yes, God has a family. Now, here's the important part. Are you a part of God's family? How many of you say, amen, I'm a part of God's family? Amen. amen, all right. Now, the next question is, if you're part of God's family, then obviously you've done this, and it's found in John chapter 14, verse 6. And I do pray that you have made this a memory verse. What is a memory verse? It's a verse that we learn in Scripture that becomes a part of our life. And uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to hold them up in the air. Hold them up in the air. This is my Bible. It's the Word of God. 
I'll trust it. I believe in it. For it is my sword of faith. Amen. Now turn with me, please, to John chapter 14, verse 6. If you have not underlined it, you need to do so. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way. What does that mean, church? In order for you to be a part of God's family, you have to be within Jesus Christ. He needs to be your Lord and Savior, for He is the way. He's the way to what? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one. What does that mean? No one. That's pretty simple, isn't it? No one can get to the Father except through who? Through Jesus Christ. He says, no one can get to the Father except through me. So if you just said that you are part of the family of God, that means that you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Because that is the only way to the Father. That is the only way to God. Well, what do we know about our God? What did we learn last week about our Father? Our Father, first and foremost, He's infinite. There is nothing and no one like Him. He is the creator of the universe. In fact, He is your creator. He says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are God's creation. But even being part of God's creation, it does not make us one of God's children. To be God's child, we have to what? We have to follow John chapter 14, verse 6, that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ must be our Lord and Savior. So not only do we serve the awesome, most holy, infinite God, but we also serve a God that has unlimited power. Unlimited power. And we have the access to tap into that power, do we not, church? Not only do we have the access to tap into the unlimited power of God, but we have His unlimited grace and His unlimited mercy. Although that little, uh, uh, that little thing that uh, 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 Judy and uh, David did, there was some humor in that, but there was so much reality in that as well. How many of you make a mistake every day? Come on, be honest with me. How many of you sin every day? And if you don't raise your hand, you're doing it right now. <laughs> Amen. We sin every day because we are not perfect. Maybe there's a thought that went through your mind. Maybe there was something on the internet that you looked at. Maybe there was a place that you went that you knew you should not be. The reality is, aren't you so thankful that we serve a God that has grace and mercy to forgive us? Amen, Amen church? So we serve a God of unlimited power, unlimited grace, unlimited mercy, and unlimited love. Aren't you so thankful that He loves us? He loves us so much that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to make a way for us to die for our sins. Amen, church? That's unlimited love. How many of you have that kind of love for one another? You heard in that little, little thing there that they did about Judy saying that she needed to pray for Bill because Bill had done her wrong. I did a message this past week. In fact, how many of you are listening to the radio broadcast during the course of the week? Good. Thank you for those two of you that are listening to that. Really appreciate that. You can find that on 93.1 every day at 1234, 1234. I encourage you to listen to that. Uh, there's a lot of time and effort that goes into those five-minute messages. One of them this week was about forgiveness about forgiveness. That's the most difficult thing for us to do, is it not, church? It's difficult to forgive. But the Lord said that we, as a follower of His, must forgive. Quiet in the house of the Lord. He has unlimited grace. He has unlimited mercy. He has unlimited love. Therefore, are we not to be like Christ? even when those wrong us. Listen, one of the part of that message that I brought this week on forgiveness is the forgiveness is not as much for them as it is for us. Did you hear that prayer? Judy said, hey, listen, I can now be released of the guilt. Released of, uh, how many of you plan your day trying to figure out how to get back at somebody? Amen? Some of you, again, won't admit it, <laughs> but some of you are doing it. Some of you right now are probably thinking, well, i got somebody who just came to mind right now, and if I could figure out how to get to them, I would. So what are you living with? You're living with the guilt and the anguish and the pain and the anger that comes from not forgiving. So God's unlimited grace, His unlimited mercy, and His unlimited love. And you know what else I love about our Father? He's always available. He's always available. Now listen, you may not be able to get a hold of me, you may not be able to get a hold of one of the deacons, but you can always get a hold of him. Amen? Praise God for that. Praise God for that, that we can get a hold of him at any time because he is our Father. So now let's get to the next part of this message this morning. Our Father, we're going to get into the next part, which is 
His holy name. Now, before we recite this prayer together, it is the prayer that Jesus gave us as His model prayer. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray like you pray. Teach us to have access to the throne of God like you do to your Father. And Jesus gave them this prayer. It's a prayer that reveals God's power. Write this down. It's a prayer that reveals God's power. It's a prayer that reveals God's purpose. It's a prayer that reveals God's provision. It's a prayer that reveals God's pardon. It's a prayer that reveals God's protection. And it's a prayer that reveals God's personality, His character. So will you stand with me, please, as we recite this prayer together? You'll find it up on the screen this morning. Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 through 13. If you'll pray this prayer with me this morning, church. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So last week we talked about our Father having access to the throne of our God through Jesus Christ. Now the next part of this prayer talks about what? Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Now you notice that I don't do this very often because sometimes it can be quite confusing when I start throwing out Greek and Hebrew names, but I thought this morning I would give you the Greek The Greek definition or the Greek word for hallowed is hagios. I even gave you the pronunciation for it if you'd like to write it down. Well, what does it mean? It means most high. It means highly respected. It means sacred. So when we see hallowed be thy name, we're saying holy is your name. We're saying sacred is your name. We're saying the most respected is your name. Are you with me, church? So we go, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus was saying, Lord, your name shall be considered sacred. Your name, Lord, shall be considered holy. Your name, Lord, is to be glorified. In fact, Jesus was saying, It's not about me, Lord. It's all about you. It's about adoring you. It's about worshiping you. It's about calling you hallowed, holy is your name. Not only is His name holy, but the very book that you hold in your hand is holy. For it is of God, which makes it His holy Bible. Did you ever wonder why they call it the Holy Bible? It's to be the most respected book. It's to be the most adored book. It's to be the book that is to be worshipped because it is the Word of God. Holy is His Word. Not only is the Word of God holy, but also we as Christians are commanded to live a holy life as he is holy. How many of you have ever thought of that? You see, the, uh, Jesus said there, hallowed be thy name. Holy Lord are you. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, am I not to live a separate life, a separated life from the world? A holy life. What do you think, church? Amen or oh me? How many of you want to live a separate life? A separated life from the world. Different. How many of you want to live a holy and acceptable life as Paul said is our reasonable service as a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen? So he says that we are to be holy as he is holy. In fact, if you'll allow me this morning, I have several scriptures. They're up there on the screen for you. I encourage you to follow along with me. I'm going to go very slow because I want you to to rustle the pages. You know, rustling the pages should be like trying to find one of them songs in a hymn book in in the church. Amen? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn, please. The first two are going to be found in 1 Peter. 1 Peter, that is in the New Testament. There's a 1 and 2 Peter. Well, this morning, we're going to go to two verses. First one found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 and 16. And then you can put your finger right over at 1 Peter chapter 3. And then we're going to go to Psalms. But I want you to underline these verses. Make notes of these, please, in your bulletin. The Lord said His name, God's name, should be holy, and that we are to live a holy life, for He is holy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 and 16, it says, As obedient children. Who is He talking to, church? Us. We are to be the obedient children of who? Of God the Father. So as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. 
Verse 15 says, But like the Holy One, who is that church? God. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all of your behavior. Because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. I don't know about you, but I find this to be a command as a follower of Jesus Christ that I should strive to live my life holy, as Paul said, and acceptable to Him. Again, this is only my reasonable service. How many of you find it very difficult to live a holy and a separated life? Come on, be honest with me. Sometimes difficult, isn't it? Especially when somebody, as you're driving down Interstate 75, pulls in front of you and shows you the finger that he should not show you. How many of you feel holy and acceptable at that moment? We do not, do we? But the Word of God says that we're to live a separated life, a different life. How many of you, instead of getting angry, say, Lord, be with that person? <laughs> yeah, you probably add something else to it too, don't you? Yeah. Hey, listen, we are to live a holy and acceptable life. Look at chapter number 3, verse 15. It says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. What does that mean? That means to hold our Lord and our Savior with the utmost respect. Consider Him holy within our heart. It goes on and it says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks, to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. You know what that verse tells me? That verse tells me that if I am living a separated life of the world, that verse tells me that if I am living a holy life unto God, that people are going to want to know what's different about me. And I should be able to share with them the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. How many of you believe that this morning? How many of you take the opportunity? In fact, let me ask you this question, and I just, I'm just going to throw this out there for some thought. How many of you have actually had someone come to you and said, Hey, listen, there's something different about you, and I sure would like to know what it is. That's sharing with someone the hope in Jesus Christ. One of the great things I love about this bracelet is people ask questions. Marty, what's that all about? And get an opportunity to share that. Now, Miss Jean is not here this morning, but I want to share with you something. On Friday night, we, uh, several of us were working the concession stand at the, uh, at the high school for the basketball game. By the way, I took over 500 braces, and I'm, I'm happy to say, church, that all 500 of those braces were took by kids at that basketball game that night. So, you know, every time one of those kids or their parents look at that, they're going to see not only the name of the Fellowship of the Hills, but they're going to see that just one more. And they're going to ask a question, what does that mean, just one more? And I hope you're able to explain just one more means that we want to reach at least one more for Jesus Christ. How do we do that? By sharing the hope that we have in Him. Now, Miss Jean Clark called me up that Friday night while we were at the basketball game. And as you know, many of you know that she's home now. She's recuperating from her surgery and, and uh, has a nurse that comes in from time to time. And several of our wonderful folks in this church, man, I just love you guys to death because you guys are a family. And you are being a family to those that are inflicted with an illness. So as she is there recuperating and, and needing help with a feeding tube and, and various other things that's going on in the home along with you know, her and Marvin, uh, she called me Friday night. She says, Pastor, I need to share something with you. One of the ladies, one of the nurses who's been coming to help me out, I had the opportunity just a moment ago to lead her to Christ. And she wanted to share that with me. Now let me share something with you. How many of you have ever wondered why you're in the position where you're at? How many of you have ever wondered why you're in a condition that you're in? Maybe some of you have, instead of saying, Whoa, me, you need to say, Lord, what would you want me to do in the place that you have me? And I shared with her at that very moment. By the way, she put her on the phone. And I had that moment to pray with her and to praise God with her that she had just become part of the family of God. And I said to her, now you can call him your father. And then she put Jean back on the phone. I said, Jean, listen to me. I said, I know that you kind of wonder at times why you're in the place that you're in. Why you've gone through what you've gone through. And she says, not anymore. Let me tell you what's awesome about that. What's awesome about that is whatever place that God has us, remember we talked about this a few weeks ago, look for the opportunity that God's giving you to share the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. And she did that. She could have said, woe is me, I'm in so much pain, I don't want to be here anymore, I don't want to do this anymore. Instead, that lady saw something in her that was different than she had seen in any other patient. And you know what? Jean got a chance to share with her about the hope of Jesus Christ in her Amen, church? Amen. Psalm chapter 34, verse 3 says, I'll give you a moment to turn there or write it down and go home and, and look this up. It says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name forever. 
You see, we came into this house today, the Lord's place. It is just brick and mortar. We've got some wonderful chairs that are comfortable to sit on. But it's not about you. And it's not about me. It's all about Him. We came today to sing His praises, to adore Him, to glorify Him, to lift His name on high. We came to read from His holy book, to get His message that He has for us this morning, to exalt Him, to hear what it is He would have us to learn this week, that we could go out of the highways and the byways of this world to be a separated person from this world so people can see the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and they'll want to know how it is that we can live in this world and have a smile on our face because we serve the God of the creator of the universe that has unlimited power, unlimited grace, unlimited mercy, and His unlimited love. I want to share with you some, as we talk about glorifying His holy name, I have, you know, the, the, the Word of God is just saturated with different names for God. And I want to share with you some of my favorites. Can I do that this morning? Let me share with you some of my favorites. Elohim. Elohim means God Almighty and strong. El Shaddai, God Almighty. Adonai means Lord. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord is my provider. How many of you believe that this morning? God is your provider. Jehovah Rapha, which means the Lord who heals. How many of you are thankful for the healing power of the great physician in our God? Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner. Did you know that the very book that you carry is the banner of the Lord? Amen? Some of you never look at the banner. I encourage you to understand Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. Jehovah Makedesh, the Lord who sanctifies and makes holy. Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. Aren't you so thankful for the God that gives peace? A peace that passes all understanding. Jehovah Shidnu. The Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Rafi, the Lord is my shepherd. Amen, church? The Lord is my shepherd. Well, as I think about the holy names of God, I sent Deanna one of my favorite songs. In just a moment, we're going to sing just the first verse. We won't sing the entire song all the way through. But holy, holy, holy. Before we sing that, let me tell you a little bit about the author. The author, his name was Reginald Herbert. Reginald was a, a minister back in the, uh, the Church of England during the 1700s. He died at the age of 43 in 1826. But he wrote this song, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. It was written as they were going to celebrate what was called Trinity Sunday. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. As he, shortly after he died at age 43, his wife was going through the various writings. He wrote like 53 hymns. And uh, as she came across these hymns, she sent them to a composer. His name was John Dykes. And John Dykes composed the music, put it in other words, to song or to, uh, to music. And today, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty is one of the most famous songs ever written. And if you'll allow me this morning, I would like to sing it with you as we bring up this song, singing just this first verse. Sing it with me, church. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Jana, let's keep singing it. The end the song shall arise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. All God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. His name is holy. Now let me ask you, ask you these three questions, and I want you to respond to them. In fact, if you would, on the back of your bulletin, go ahead and put your response on the back of your bulletin. Number one, do you keep the name of God holy? Do you keep the name of God holy? Number two, does the church keep the name of God holy does the church 
keep the name of God holy. Number three, does our nation keep the name of God holy? Oh, I had a lot of response on that one. Now, let me ask you this question. Let's go back to the very first one. Do you keep the name of God holy? Well, there should be no trying to this. I've got to be honest with you. I pray that in this room, no one, no one, and if you have, I pray that you've confessed it to our Lord, would ever take the Lord's name in vain, would ever curse His name. For His name is to be a name respected above all names. I don't care how angry you get. I don't care how mad you get. I don't even care if you lose control of yourself. Don't ever take the name of my God in vain. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Do we as a church revere, reverend the name of God the Father? Now my question for you this morning, church, I want to ask you this. The responsibility of our church always will be to take the name of the Lord God and keep it in high reverence. Amen? Amen. Amen. We are not here to self-satisfy. We are not here to self-gratify. We're not here to become self-successful. We're not here to come and hear a warm and fuzzy message about how we can be great. We come here because He is great. We come here to worship Him because He is holy. I'm here to tell you that there are churches across this country where we preached this message several weeks ago in the book of Revelation called the Church of Laodicea. That's the church of compromise that has put everything else above God. And they only use God as the conduit For the end. How sad. Listen, I am so thankful that I have Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior that I am saved from the wrath of God. But let me tell you something it's not about having fire insurance, it's about serving the Creator of the universe. You see, there's more to God than eternity. That's a wonderful thing and it's an incredible gift. But you know what? I serve a God that can do anything and all things through me today. Amen? So it's not about fire insurance. We talk about the church. So I think it's about time, don't you agree, church, that any of those that call themselves the church, the family of God, need to be keeping His name above all, even themselves. Now let's talk about our nation. We we live in a country that our forefathers had founded years ago, and God was at the core. Now this message is not about our country. But as we see a decline in the home, as we see a decline in the church, so too will we see a decline in the country. Maybe it's time that we as Christians get off of our blessed assurance and start living the holy and acceptable life that we should live, serving the holy and acceptable God. Amen? You want to see a country change? Then Christians need to be a part of the change. Amen? Whether you believe it or not, the Christians in this country are the majority. They're not the minority, but we're allowing the minority to rule the majority. And it's time for a change. How can that happen? That can happen in and only when those that call themselves followers of the Almighty God start living the life and serving the Almighty God. Well, God deserves our respect. Would you not agree with me, church? God deserves our respect. And it's respect not out of fear, because we as followers of Jesus Christ, we have what? We have overcome the world. We've overcome death. God has promised us an eternal life. But yet, let me ask you this question. Should God not be respected? Should God not be feared? Amen. Yes, He should. But we live in a world today where not even our country fears God. And I'm going to tell you, when the fear of God subsides, when it ceases, so too God's wrath will come. Amen, church, or oh me? I want want you to listen to some verses, and I want you to write these down. God deserves our respect. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 through 29. Hebrews 12, 28 through 29. Now listen to this. I've got it up on the screen for you. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, do we not have a kingdom that cannot be shaken? Yes or no, church? Yes. Listen to this. Because we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. How many of us show gratitude to our Father? We need to be showing gratitude by which we may offer to our God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. Now listen to this next part of this verse in verse number 29. For our God is a consuming fire. Woo, that's powerful stuff right there now. 
Amen? God deserves our respect. We should be in all that God has given us eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. We should be in all that we as followers of Jesus Christ will escape His consuming fire. Amen? One day, the Word of God says, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that He is Lord. Those who have refused to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior do not have fire insurance. Amen? I mean, I can put it as plain as can be. They will find out what fire is all about. You see, God is to be respected. Yes, God is love. But my friend, I'm telling you, God hates sin. And there will be a penalty and a payment for sin. The penalty and payment has already been taken care of on the cross of Calvary through Jesus Christ. And those who have refused to accept it will pay the debt themselves by the consuming fire. Now I want you to notice something. God is to be respected. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, look at this verse. I love this verse. It says, Do not fear those who can kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. Isn't it amazing how we fear what people think of us? I don't know about you, but I fear what God thinks of me. Amen, church? Oh, I don't want anybody to know I'm a Christian. I don't want anybody to know that I go to church. Woo! People are going to look at me funny. It may be embarrassing. Don't fear what men can do to the body, for they are unable to kill the soul. But rather, fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and and body. Payday will come someday. And I don't know about you, but my payment has already been paid on Calvary. You see, you can take this body, but my soul already belongs to the King of Kings, the Holy and Almighty God. How about you, church? Well, how about Psalm chapter 119, 120. Now, you won't forget that. It follows along. Psalm 119, 120. It says, My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says, Oh, man, if there was one verse that you should memorize and have uh, within, just burned within your heart, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what, church? Knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hey, that very book that you hold in your hand is the book of knowledge. Amen, church? So if you want to know about the Lord, if you want to know about our God, then you should get into His holy book because it provides for you wisdom and knowledge. Only a fool. Now listen to me very carefully. It just fascinates me. Only a fool would want to pay their sin debt. And by the way, <laughs> you'll pay it with your soul. Only a fool would want to do that. You see, knowledge and wisdom comes from knowing the book. Holy and acceptable. We talk about our nation. I remember it wasn't too long ago when all of the discrepancies started coming up about our Pledge of Allegiance that says one nation under God. Isn't it amazing that one small group decided that that should be removed from our pledge? In fact, so much so that the very Ninth Circuit, which is a whole other ball game on the other side of the country, the Ninth Circuit, hey, listen, we need to pray for them. That Ninth Circuit decided, hey, listen, that is unconstitutional, so you ain't got to do it. Doesn't even have to be a part of it. In fact, you can remove it if you want to. I'm not here to talk about corporations. Uh, I'm going to have a message this week that's going to be in the radio that talks about the definition of the word bless. I, I look forward for you. Some of you, you just tune in. It'll be one day this week. I'm going to talk about the word bless. How dare you tell me that I can't say have a blessed day? How dare you tell me that I can't say God bless you? How dare you take away my, my right as a citizen of this country to say bless you who do you think you are but yet we live in a time where this is happening why is it happening because we who are followers of jesus christ the majority of this country has not stood up and said he is holy and his name is holy and we serve a holy god and he's got more power than you amen let me take you back to general george washington 
Don't remember General. Any kids in here, uh, youth, remember who George Washington is? I know that they're not teaching American history in the schools today, so you probably have no idea who George Washington is. They're teaching you how you become everything else, but they're not teaching. Amer in fact, the, the American history they're teaching today is how we messed up as a country, how we picked on people. I guess they're not teaching them what this country has done in the name of the Lord in being the Savior to many countries. You don't hear about that anymore. But let me share with you, his name was George Washington. He was a great general. In fact, Susan and I, just this past week, we were watching this series. Uh, on, it was called Sons of Liberty. Did anybody see that? Wow, really, what a really cool uh, story about the, the Sons of Liberty in Boston and, and how our, our country, you know, uh, uh, Britain and all that came. You know, it was just a really cool story. Anyway, for those that didn't see it, again, a little history. But General Washington, what was really cool and fascinating for me watching that series was seeing kind of George Washington come alive and what a great leader he was. Many of the times we hear about George Washington chopped down, chop, chop down the cherry tree and he admitted that he didn't lie and all that good stuff. But he was an incredible leader, an incredible general. And, and I pulled an excerpt out of one of his uh, orders, one of his general orders, and it's up on the screen. Now, he wrote this uh, back in August of 1776, and this was part of his general orders, orders that went out to the troops, went out to the army there, and I want you to listen to what he wrote. And it was disseminated and passed out through his, his, uh, his leaders uh, to, all of the, uh, to all of the army, and it says that the troops may have an opportunity of attending public worship. Hey, wouldn't it be great if our commander-in-chief would send that order out today? President, it would be a great thing if you're watching on YouTube today, which you probably are not, but it would be a great thing, sir, if you would tell our troops that they have the privilege and the right to go to worship. He said that they have an opportunity to go to public worship. Notice what else he says. As well as take some rest after the great fatigue that they have gone through. The general in future excuses them from fatigue duty on Sundays, except at the shipyards or special occasions, until further orders. The general is sorry to be informed that the foolish and wicked practice of profane cursing and swearing, a vice hitherto, or hereto, little known in an American army, is growing into fashion. He hopes the officers will, by example, as well as influence, endeavor to check it, and that both they and the men will reflect that we can have little hopes of the blessing of heaven on our arms if we insult it by our impiety and folly. Added to this, it is a vice so mean and low, without any temptation, that every man of sense and character detests and despises it. Wouldn't it be great that if our commander-in-chief and our generals today would tell their soldiers, hey, listen, we have no hope if we take the holy name of our God in vain. We can only hope and pray that He will bless us because we reverend him. General George Washington, 1776. We can learn a lot from our history, could we not, church? We as followers of our holy God could learn a lot from history. Holy is his name. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, I want you to follow along with me as we bring this message to a close my friend, if we are a people of God, if we are the church of the living God, if we are to be a nation under God, then we better follow His Scripture. This verse is an incredible verse, or these verses are found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Notice it says, Hear, O Israel. Can, we, can I just... Can I take Israel out of, out of that? And can I just say, here, O nation, here, O United States, here, Fellowship of the Hills, here, and you can put your name in here. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. Now I want you to just put off to the side there if you have your Word of God open. I just want you to say either yes or no. That's your response. Are you serving the Lord today with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might? Follow along with me. These words, which I am commanding you today, shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently 
to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. If you want to see your family that is not in disarray, if you want to see a family that's not broken, you'll see a family who sits down and who loves and worships the Holy God. And my dear friend, if you're going through issues like that, if something like that's happening today, then maybe it's time to get in God's Word, to bring God in your home and in your life. We live in a time. I don't know where they get some of their reports, but I know what I see. I know what I read. We live in a time where crime is to a point it is almost out of control. If you would have told me years ago that on the streets of New York that people would randomly just decide that they wanted to kill police, I would have said you're crazy. Sporadically, I know those things happen because they're just those types of individuals. But to see people who would cheer for something like that? My friend, we live in a wicked time. Teenage pregnancy is at an all-time high. Broken homes are at an all-time high. In fact, in fact, the very country that I live in is attempting to redefine what a family is. Pretty simple. Go to the Word of God, it'll tell you what a family is. The Word of God tells you how to raise your children. The Word of God tells us that if we would teach our sons and our daughters about the Lord, Let's go on. Verse number 8. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. What's he talking about? The Word of God. The Word of God should be at the very forefront of your life. It should be in every decision that you make. Listen, there's some wonderful self-help books out there that, that tap into the Word of God and, and kind of help you to understand what it means. But my dear friend, people ask me all the time, well, Marty, I don't get it. Uh, you know, I, I read the Word of God, but I just don't get it. Well, here's, let me just suggest to you, first and foremost, go to the Lord in prayer before you ever crack that book open. Go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, right now I, I need your understanding and I need your knowledge. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him. And He'll direct your path. First and foremost, go to the Lord in prayer. Open up the book. Begin to study the book. Get you a great study Bible that has a concordance. What is a concordance? Concordance usually is in the center, column of the Bible, somewhere off to the sides, that will help in directing you to different places within the Word of God where that verse is associated to another verse or another place of Scripture. In other words, making the Word of God come alive. And by the way, that is the living Word of God. It has the power to change a life. My dear friend, Holy is His name. Hallowed be your name. My friend, as we think and study the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer that the Lord gave us, I want you to notice that at the very beginning of the prayer, we go to the Father. At the very beginning of the prayer, it's about Him, not about us.